Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. Uh, along with the tech staff at the Commonwealth Club, uh, we're bringing you another online program in our series uh, since the COVID-19 crisis started. Um, live streaming to you is much of what the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco does uh, in general when we have our live audiences, bringing to you uh, a large number of public affairs, but in addition to that, uh, the uh, best authors from across the world uh, in different areas of history, biography, and so on, so that we have a better understanding of the basis in our culture for what we're actually doing right now in our current affairs. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sophie Roberts, who's coming to us from London uh, on her new book, The Lost Pianos uh, of Siberia. Uh, really quite a, an interesting uh, angle to investigate the, what the former Soviet Union, Russia, and basically Siberia uh, I, when, I, when I read the book, uh, I thought that everyone who thinks about colonizing the moon or Mars or, or, or one of the other planets should read this first, because this is what, our, this is what, our, uh, what it would be like. Um, all the colonies of, in, in Siberia that have been developed over the last couple hundred years, and in general, our, our, our method of using convicts uh, to start Australia, the, the colony of Georgia in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's such a, a, a long-term cultural effect. What a great adventure you had, Sophie. So thank you very much for joining us from London. And uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about what first, uh, before we go into to, to the great slideshow you have of Russia, 
why did you pick this? And, and, and how did you get started writing that? It's a very interesting story, I thought. You, you started with one angle on tigers and so on. But how did you end up chasing down lost pianos as your theme? Well, <laughs> well <laughs> it happened um, curiously, not because of being in Russia, but in Mongolia. I've spent a lot of time in Mongolia over the years um, with my family and my kids. And we were staying with some family friends. Um, he's German and she's Mongolian. And they spend their whole summers out on the steppe, about eight hours from the capital, Ulaanbaatar. And it's a really magical spot. It's in the Orkon Valley of Cradle of a very ancient civilization. And in this valley, they live in Mongolian gares, the tents, the felted tents, uh, mm -hmm. the snaking river below. It's, it's a very magical place. And in 2015, I was staying and I met a young pianist, a very brilliant pianist, who was teaching piano to some of the young children. And she was playing on a Yamaha piano that in the extreme climates of Mongolia um, had really suffered. Um, and it wasn't playing the sound that it should have been playing. Uh, mm -hmm. It certainly wasn't playing a sound that matched her great gift. And anyway, she was playing Bach one evening, the silver stars above. You can imagine the smoke coming out of the little fire that curls upwards into the sky. And I thought it was just mesmerizing. But my friend, the German gentleman who has a much greater musical ear than I, said, oh, it's something's off. It's not sounding quite right. We must find her. And he used this phrase, the lost pianos of Siberia. And mm -hmm. what he was referring to was an extraordinary moment in Russian cultural history, um, which we'll get onto, I think, later in the in the program today. But it's it to someone like me, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, and I was struck by the sheer absurdity of that remark, uh, the mm -hmm. idea of a piano in a frozen wasteland, and also, frankly, the poetry. And it sets something moving in my psyche, and I'm restless. It also sets something moving in my feet. So off uh -huh. I went <laughs> on a fairly <laughs> crazy endeavor um, that yeah. has brought us together today. Well, it was a crazy endeavor, but it came out with quite a quite a stunning book. Um, and it might one of the things that we will we'll go into the Siberian uh, element for a second, you know, for, for the entire show actually. But it reminded me of what happened in in, in Beijing uh, and and China recently, and that is, you know, Beethoven was was, uh, you know, all the classical music, everything was was shut down by the communists uh, in the '40s and the '50s and so on and so forth. But there they. Uh, created a, I think there was a children's book, if I remember correctly the story. There was a children's book that they did about Beethoven, about how he overcome terrible difficulties of being deaf and still created great music that was uh, popular that they used to try to get everybody to be uh, resilient under the very difficult circumstances of the 50s and 60s in, in China. And so all kinds of people read this story and then that created an interest in Beethoven. That was not their intent. Their intent was, you know, his story. And that interest in Beethoven went to a large amount of music. Um, and then all kinds of kids were trained as, as things opened up. And now we have a lot of the top pianists in, in the world coming out of China. Mm, and it's very incredible. strange how, how this happens in just a couple of decades. Um, and your story has a lot of elements of that in it. So, and we go right into the, to the uh, pictures and the story. I, I love the way you started with the uh, list mania. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we can get started with that. So if we have the pictures, they can be put up. Perfect. Uh, one, one, one little thing about the map. When I was in the Soviet Union in 73, I bought a map for 10 Kopex. Um, <laughs> and and it, it always, uh, it was a map of the whole world, but uh, Siberia was center stage. And that makes the United States look very small on the one side. And, and the United States does just the opposite. You know, it puts themselves in the center and stretches you out. So, so when you stretch something out, it looks big. But there is no question that Siberia and, and Russia is, is the largest landmass, of course, uh, in terms of country. Well, so, it, makes, it makes Great Britain look quite a lot smaller again. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, but it was always, and you're absolutely right, because Siberia, the size of it was mesmerizing to me as a child. You know, I saw this just huge white space on my on a globe that I had beside my bed when I was a kid. And when I started to look into it at the beginning of the story, it was like, you know, what is Siberia? Siberia isn't even really a place. It's difficult mm. to pin down. It's mm. a concept as much as anything else. The geographical political boundaries have changed over time. So I went um, for the kind of most poetic description 
impossible, which was the old imperial period, the Tsarist period, when Anton Chekhov um, was traveling across Siberia um, to do an investigation on the penal exile system. He described Siberia as beginning somewhere in, in Ekaterinburg. You see the city here in, yeah. in the Ural Mountains. And he said it, it stretching to, and this wonderful phrase, goodness knows where. I took that to read the Far East, all the way mm. to Kamchatka, which you see on the right in the Pacific and the Kuril Islands. To a modern Siberian, that would not be correct. It's the Russian Far East. I also included the Far North, right up to the Arctic and down um, mm. it, where you see the border with Mongolia. You know, it's about a tenth of the world's land mass. Uh, there is no road connecting Kamchatka, you see on the right to the rest mm. of Russia. All the rivers flow the wrong way. Um, they're flowing, um, um, not so you know it's impossible to travel across it aside mm. from when that trans-siberian railway came along so i was fascinated by the size of it but i think it's a good place to start to see where i began the story in the orkhon valley in mongolia and then ended up ranging widely across this great great region um, that i refer um, to as siberia and you you covered so much ground when, when you go from one chapter to the next. So now how many thousands of miles did she go to get to this one? You know, it was, you, you went all over the place. Uh, so what, one little detail before we go into the story too. How much time did you spend wandering around? No, wandering is the wrong word, but moving around there. You, it was a lot uh, of time. Yeah, I think it was about 190 days in the end. I've, I've, wow. I've, I've calculated. It was as many days as my Russian visa would allow me down to the last 24 hours. Um, and uh -huh. then were, so, yeah, it was, ta it, was, it was a long time. And I spent, I, I took my kids there. I spent family time there. Um, I would have spent more if I could have done. Um, there's so many places I didn't get to see, um, which mm -hmm. still ache. Um, but yeah, it was, it was occupying, let's see. <laughs> But you, you, as, as the story continues, uh, everyone will see. But you were, you were, at all different points on the map, all different points on this map, all the way to Kamchatka. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just to give you a, a sort of sense of it, Ekaterinburg, you see in the Ural Mountains, that's, of course, where the last Tsar was murdered. Um, mm -hmm. Then we moved Novosibirsk, you see in the middle, that's the kind of effectively the, the de facto capital of Siberia. Lake mm -hmm. Baikal, which you see right over there. Now, that's where Anton Chekhov said the poetry begins and mm -hmm. that everything after is, is, is where the magic really happens. Um, Sakhalin Island on the far right is the, the Tsarist penal um, colony, the biggest one of all. And the most feared. And then you have um, Vladivostok, the termination of that Trans-Siberian Railway. There's a, an awful lot in between. There's an area which the word Siberia on this map is written over called Yakutsk, Yakushia, or the Saka Republic. That is the size of India, just to give you an mm -hmm. idea. I think you will know from your, your work in, in the Soviet Union, but um, right. it's just vast. It's just vast. Um, but also a pleasure to travel because you can take things slowly. I can write, I can read, and um, people give you time of day in in that part of the world i think a lot of people their image uh, at least uh, from my generation their image of, of siberia is the uh, scenes from the movie dr Zhivago, where he's walking back through the snow so you have plenty of those kind of scenes too i mean it, it saw in the little movie ahead of time uh walking yeah. through snow up to your up to your uh, thighs well, so, to be honest, you've hit the nail on the head. 19th, the great 19th century and um, early 20th century literature that came out of Russia filled me with romance long before I arrived here. Um, you know, mm -hmm. they always have. Um, it was in my imaginative, um, in my in my imaginative psyche before I'd even set foot in that snow. Yeah, and it's uh, just one aside to the, for the current time. Um, it seemed that President Putin uh, during the Winter Olympics was trying to remind all the Europeans of, of uh, all the contributions from that late 19th century, early 20th century, which the uh, Russians gave in music and dance and, and uh, uh, literature, uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Pushkin, uh, on and on and on and on. And so it was like, come on now, how much more European do we have to be before we're European? But, uh, but when you see the whole story that you lay it out, it's European and it's not European. So it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting mix and, and it's uh, always had uh, cultural issues as a result. Every, every culture has their cultural issues, but that seems to be one that goes deep into the psyche in Russia. Uh, are, we, are we Russian? I mean, are we, we're Russian, but are we European or are we Asian? And it, it, the other interesting you know, technical question is, it, it's considered that Europe and Asia are two different continents, but when you look at it, I mean, they're connected. 
there is no difference. But the Ural Mountains, and you, you, you talked a little bit about the split that was, was growing. Um, th there, is a, there is a reason why they're considered different continents from a technical point of view. Yeah, and ecological, and and you know if if the plates keep moving, where we'll see that split is right through the middle. So, but it's also, you know, what happened, and the piano, as we'll get onto, is is it was to me a very good instrument to tell the story of the European colonization of Asiatic Siberia, because of course it was a European instrument. It mm -hmm. came out of Italy, um, Germany, Vienna, London. Uh, it 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 became. A, a huge fashion in Petersburg and Moscow, but it was taken into this Asiatic space called Siberia, where mm. a, a land of, of, of rich indigenous history. Uh, that's it was those very peculiarities that, that I found kind of compelling about that very phrase when I started. Great. Well, let's go right to the story. Um, the uh, so, next, uh, next slide, maybe. So this is the Orkon Valley. This is where I first heard that piano music coming out of the Gare, um, the Mongolian tent. Um, mm -hmm. And you can imagine there's nothing, nothing, nothing at all, apart from the families of, of these great friends of mine, local herd of families, um, and, and, and a piano music. It was most peculiar. Um, if we go on to the next slide, you can see what happened next, which was... Um, so I, I, it's a, it's an, a curious one. This, but the first trip I did, um, I went out to Khabarovsk, right on the Pacific edge, or towards the Pacific edge of um, of Russia, um, to work with a, a tiger conservationist, a wild tiger conservation with the Siberian or Amur tiger. And I was doing a piece for I write for the Financial Times as well. I was doing a piece for them, and I thought I'd see if I even like this place before I get too stuck in. And mm -hmm. of course, I. I left the city. I was in a car. I was riding out to his cabin about three hours outside of the, uh, the city. And within five minutes, the most extraordinary thing happened. Mm -hmm. We saw these prints in the snow. And that gentleman you see there, Alexander Batilov, he, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't believe it. He's a professional conservationist, see a tiger, wild tiger in the wild, maybe, you know, once or twice in their lives. Mm -hmm. And when we turned a corner, there it was lying in the snow, this kind of extraordinary mm -hmm. golden animal. There's less, as I say, less than 500 left in the world and in an area mm -hmm. that's a tenth of the world land surface and it's there. And at that moment, I became uh, profoundly um, superstitious that I had to do this. He was encouraging me saying, look, it'll, if you can find a wild tiger in, out here, then you can definitely find a piano. So get on <laughs> with it <laughs> and it will bring you great luck. And um, and I was, I was very grateful to him. He was the son of a musician himself and he understood what I was doing with once uh, without ever questioning its absurdity or its eccentricity he just thought it was a natural <laughs> a natural pursuit so for that I was very grateful well it might, might have seemed normal to someone who, who was watching out for 500 tigers in an area that large <laughs> that, that looking for pianos doesn't seem that weird you know unusual <laughs> you, had, you had the right advisor <laughs> yeah no, he was wonderful he was like a shaman he was great mm -hmm. So then after I, I, I had had that sort of rather curious moment, I started to look more into the history. I went home but to England and, and delved into libraries, delved into letters, delved into archives. And what I did discover was this extraordinary um, history with the piano and Russia and therefore Siberia later on. And it started effectively with Catherine the Great. Um, she wasn't; she didn't have a particularly musical ear, but she was a great anglophile. Any gardener, any architect she could pull in from England, she would. And it, that included piano makers. And she bought a little, a little English-made zumpe piano anglaise in a 1774 piano, which still rather remarkably to this day survives. Um, it survived the war and the siege of Leningrad by being evacuated to Siberia for self -keep safekeeping, a wonderful mm -hmm. little instrument you can find in, in, in one of the museums in Petersburg. But the um, she encouraged it. Her daughter-in-law took up the baton even, even, even more enthusiastically. She witnessed Mozart and Clementi duel in Vienna in one of these famous pianistic duels and was completely mm -hmm. uh, 
captivated. She pulled Clementi into Russia. He was a piano maker as well as a composer and player. And Clementi could not make pianos quick enough. He couldn't sell them fast enough. Uh, meanwhile, the Russians were introducing um, um, tax breaks, state subsidies, bringing in the, the, the talent from the German speaking lands. And piano mania was unleashed. So much so that what the image you see here is Franz Liszt playing in a in a concert of 1842 and it was like it was like a kind of rolling stones of his time the mm -hmm. women were grabbing at his hair they were picking up the cherry pips that he spat out onto the floor to wear as amulets it was a complete fever and um at one moment a critic calls petersburg pianopolis um it's it's for every hundred apartments um another critic talked about 93 would have a piano in it um the, mm -hmm. the tuners were making were, were, were making you know a, 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 the, the clink of the Russian ruble is one of the other um, remarks that came out of the papers from that time was mm -hmm. had a very nice ring to anybody that could put their put their virtuoso feet into Russian soil and at the same time you have European Russia moving across into Asiatic Siberia as exiles, political exiles, high profile, aristocratic political exiles um, who could afford an, a piano. You, you had governors, mavericks, misfits, all sorts moving across those Ural mountains and with them, a few of them took pianos against all odds, because of course there was no railway then. So how do you lug these great, these great, these great things over um, territory where the roads are rough? And I, I again, that 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 excited me. We'll talk more about how the piano culture continued into the um, after the revolution and the high level of musical education you still encounter in 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 Russia today. But it all stemmed from this moment of. Piano. Piano mania. It's really uh, amazing, and I, I, I liked your analogy to uh, the Rolling Stones uh, because uh, it, you know, I'd read about this before as well. But it did seem like very much. I mean, Liszt and Chopin, and so they, uh, they were the Harry Styles of their day. And I know to bring it up to up to the time. I mean, just uh, have a concert with uh, so many people um, <laughs> reacting this way. But it was interesting how the, the what happened in Russia, as you said, was that everybody wanted a piano. I mean that. That has happened before. Everyone wants a TV now, and everyone wants you know so on. But but the, the piano was the early uh, distribution of music across uh, because it was reproducible, right? Exactly, and, and, but also and also not recordable. So right. can you imagine that moment of hearing list? It becomes it becomes a a thing you talk about and talk about and talk about because nobody else can turn on a, a CD to hear it played or television to hear it repeated. And I suppose that's something we've lost in our modern world, isn't it? That sort of that that absolute moment in time, and then it's gone. Um, and yeah. there's there's a, there's, a, there's a phenomenal biography, a three part biography that I, I relied on on this that, that 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 really sinks you into the way of thinking and what a privilege it was to hear these great virtuosos touring Europe in the 1840s. And it's interesting. He you, he also toured Russia, as you said, right? And got yeah yeah. yeah. He yeah. toured yeah. Russia. Yeah. Yeah. to great acclaim and he um he also toured my rather small town where i'm based now i'm not in london i'm on the west coast of the um the southwest coast of england in dorset near lyme regis he also toured there um two years later and i found some very amusing accounts of how um it was very ill attended and the local community complained about the high price of tickets um mm -hmm. uh, not like russia russia it was a frenzy right yeah, it, that, I thought that was very interesting how what people are willing to spend their money on. But it also seemed like from the numbers that you gave that it wasn't that, you know, big an expense to buy a piano in Russia, <laughs> that they were being produced. And, and so what the relative cost to what the people were earning, at least at, at the level that everyone was buying this at, uh, seemed yeah. relatively small. Yes, that's indeed correct. There's some absolutely brilliant research. Again, you know, I owe so much to others um, by an American academic called Anne Schwartz, who's done a whole book on this. And yeah, the price of a piano uh, was 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 not crazy because of the state subsidy system that existed. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was something like the price of eight tickets to hear a recital would be the same as buying an instrument of your own. Yeah. Kind of wow. remarkable. Mm. Well, um, so we have list and piano mania. And so then a lot of Russian companies or German companies that went to Russia and opened up offices and so, and so on and, and created pianos, uh, created a large number of pianos. And 
they uh, got dispersed, as you said, some of them to Siberia, um, and you were tracking them down. I mean, you tracked down some very ancient pianos. I, I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, and not all of them can play very well as 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 a musician, oh, which yeah. I am not. Will know, you know, they lose <laughs> their sound after a period of time. But if we move to the next slide, I think it will show the kind of curiousness from if you think of Liszt and that image, eighteen forty two, to mm. now. And these are the, the this is a community I spent some time with. Nenets people up in the far north. Um, they're they're reindeer herders. Now everything they own, they um they pull behind them on the back of a sledge. So it's very uh, uh, economic living it's mm -hmm. you don't you don't you don't have keep or hold on to everything you don't anything you don't need that is that is basically not for survival. So imagine pianos coming into this space. You, you have, mm. the, it, I think it was it was a very important part of my research to understand Siberia's indigenous history before the, um, the um, before this instrument came in. You know, we have a, of about a hundred odd languages that are in Siberia, the indigenous mm -hmm. languages, they're disappearing. You know, you've got more tigers, so that's 500, than Ittleman speaking people. It's going very fast. And I wanted to feel that and understand that fragility at the same time as looking for something lost, like a piano. So the, all these themes started to pull together after a while. And, and uh, the people that are spread across uh, northern Siberia, especially, um, are, are fairly well related to the uh, Eskimos that are in Alaska and in northern Canada and you know, the Aleuts and so on. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, racially and culturally similar uh, people that live in the Arctic, right, all the way around. That, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I mean, I I was only conscious of it really when I went up into the Commander Islands, up into the Bering Sea, because mm -hmm. there were loot graves among the, uh, you know, the Chuk Ch um, in the Chukotka around there. You see a much um, closer um, crossover in that territory because it was free movement um, until modern borders lock, and lock, lock, lock us all down. But uh, yeah, culturally, there's uh, lots of similarities. One other little thing that you just mentioned uh, briefly when you were out there, but I think a lot of people are not aware unless they live in uh, Northern California, is that uh, in the early 1800s, uh, when this uh, California was still Spanish, um, there was a Russian, there was a, a large number of Russian uh, uh, colonies and that they were thinking about, you know, expanding right down through Alaska and all the way down this coast. Um, and they got as far as just a little bit north of San Francisco. They had a, yeah. they had a port there that's still there. Um, oh, and I, I think people forget this part of, of, of history altogether that we had, you know, uh, British on the on the East Coast and and we had Russians on the West Coast, along with the Spanish. Yeah, so. well, you have some wonderful. Um, I, I there was one moment, and you know, because you've read the book, how 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 much of a traveler I am, and keen to see the next horizon. But there was one moment when my publisher said to me, "Can you please just stop?" Because I started finding pianos, Russian pianos, in Nome, Alaska, and I was <laughs> I was wandering down, I was wandering down towards California, and they like enough is enough. You've you've wandered far <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would love to look into that, and it became. It's I've got a whole pile of notes actually of some of the governor's wives that did bring pianos and ship them all the way around the world and across Siberia to take them to your side of America. Yeah, maybe maybe we should uh, solve some of our issues between countries the way they did then, you know, so okay, I'll buy this big chunk of land from you while you're... <laughs> yeah, I think they sold Alaska pretty cheap actually. But, they sold Alaska um, pretty cheap, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't realize how much, they knew how cold it was and they said, we've already got a lot of cold land, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is true. But it was, you know, the, the 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 thing about it was actually how to cover that amount of ground effectively. And of course, I was very fortunate because I think if we move on to the next slide, it gives you a sense of of the means that were available to me and everybody after 1910, mm -hmm. which is the Trans-Siberian Railway. It runs for 5,500 miles in a pretty much a straight line um, uh, um, across from Moscow to Vladivostok. Um, I was, I loved being on that train. I used the local trains that just used that route. Um, the, mm -hmm. And I loved the descriptions of that train from its early days. You know, there was always a piano, sometimes a good one. Sometimes there's one wonderful 
description of the piano being used like a kitchen sideboard to stack the dirty dishes on. Um, wonderful characters. You know, this is pre-revolution. Diamonds that make your eyes ache in that same dining room. Heavily perfumed fat conductors with pink silk handkerchiefs. I just loved it. Um, the modern version is not quite so much full of the romance, but it's a, it's a very pleasant way to spend days and days reading, writing, thinking, seeing, watching the trees moving past. Um, if we move on to the next slide, this I, I think this series of, of images are good just to give you a sense of how how I travelled Siberia. You know, I had to be um, opportunistic, and uh, very much so. This is something, however, that you know um, a tourist could do. This is uh, crossing a frozen lake by Cal in winter. Um, it's the deepest lake on earth, fifth of the world's fresh water. Um, uh, that's us having a shot of vodka at its dead centre. It's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> a meter it's frozen to a meter thick at that time of year i loved baikal i went back three or four times um i i camped there with my kids um and i spent some time writing in a cabin up on a on, on another on the eastern side um a lot was lost in those waters including pianos um including um soldiers including retreating armies um and and trains um in the old days before they managed to build a loop south of Lake Baikal for the Trans-Siberian, they used to shunt the um, the uh, um, carriages onto a ship, um, an icebreaker, um, mm. and they'd cut through. Or indeed, at another point, they put rails on the ice to get across. But these days, it's as easy as taking that hovercraft. Um, I'll just race through some of these just to give another sense of the travel. If we go to right. the next slide. Um, you will see, again, this kind of opportunistic way that I had to work. This was flying north into the Nenets territory, the indigenous far north territory we were talking about before. And I used local helicopters, supply helicopters. I was on that particular journey in the in the, in the the back was a bunch of boarding kids that were sent to boarding school to, to receive their education from that Nenets community. Um, a lady who was returning to die um, by beside the sacred Lake Numpto, uh, a vet who was dealing with some anthrax, a Russian Orthodox priest spreading the word, uh, you know, all sorts. But it was great fun. But when we tried to get back, um, and well, I say we because I need to acknowledge the extraordinary work here shot by my friend and colleague, uh, Michael Turek, whose these mm -hmm. images all belong to him. Um, but when we got back, we couldn't get a heli helicopter back. These are not expensive um, to use. They, they use like buses. But um, we had to hitch with oil workers oil and gas workers um and we found the the, the generosity of strangers um ex, ex, exceeding all expectation to be honest mm. um and that's something i hope that people feel in, when they read the book that you know they say that that, that siberians do have this um this deep sense of hospitality because something lingers from their history. In the old days, if you were um, walking to Siberia in chains, the tradition was you'd always find some bread and water sitting on a windowsill that another convict would have left for you um, um, uh, that you could take off freely. And that culture of hospitality really does still exist. I, I cannot tell you the, the, the joy of knocking on a door as a potentially uh, uh, a strange English woman um, from a politically the wrong side of the gap saying, um, hello, have you got a piano? And something <laughs> happened, you know, something kind of happened. One, one that very thing depoliticized my inquiry. It put us across a kitchen table as human beings um, interested in the same things. And two, it's, it, it, you know, uh, uh, Siberians have a completely, or my experience of that part of the world, they've got a completely different relationship with space and time. They, they give you it. If that happened to me here where I live, Mm. I would make an appointment. I'd tell someone to come back. I'd check them out. Right. That right. didn't happen once, not once. Yeah. And it was very it, humbling. It was interesting, too, how you, you told stories but went, uh, of, of all the different uh, prisoners that went out at different times. But the ones that they really wanted to punish, they made walk all the way to their place in Siberia, thousands of miles, taking them months and months and months and months and months. And months uh, un, sort of the... the uh, the creativity that is ex expelled on on uh, cruelty uh, is really quite amazing. Uh, sometimes, I mean, if you're if the person's your enemy, 
but we, mm. we'll, we'll go into the, the hospitality more than the cruelty. So, well, um, the cruelty is a very important part we get to at the end because, yeah. of course, for every light, there's dark and in um, and, and, and narratives like these. And I could not do a book about Siberia without acknowledging the, 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 the huge numbers um, and the suffering over centuries. But, you know, I'm, one, so yeah, I've one, got... One thing that nobody, oh. I, I think I'd never heard of was uh, the Spanish children, the 5,000 mm. Spanish children that... that, that Stalin volunteered during the Spanish Civil War to take care of, and they ended up being just sent off to Siberia. Yeah, to Colima. That was a stunning story. Yeah, to Colima. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's astounding. But we, you know, so yeah, they were walked in chains in the gulag, they were sent in cattle trucks. Um, I'm, uh, you know, modern Siberia is a, is a free place and um, it, it functions in a modern way. In the old days, um, if we move on to the next slide, you will see, um, this is an American actually, a great American, mm -hmm. great American traveler in Siberia called George Kennan. But this is how they used to travel with a sledge. Um, and they, would, they were traveling along a road called the Great Siberian Tract, which um, a, a Chekhov was wonderful. He, he, he called it a foul smallpox of a road. Um, you know, it's mm -hmm. almost the sole artery linking Europe in Siberia and we're told that an artery like this um, civilization is flowing into Siberia he was completely dumbfounded it was agony to your back um, it was incredibly uncomfortable at any other time except the best time was winter because at least the ground was frozen but mm -hmm. another a Russian um, 19th century um, prince who was sent off there he said it was like um Traversing the road's length by sledge was like the sensation of a finger being dragged across all the keys of a piano, even the black <laughs> notes. Uh, so that's yeah. a sort of sense of the discomfort. But just imagine a piano in the back of one of those. And yeah. that, that was sort of, it was constantly, it was the absurdity as well as the humanity that kept me going. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, uh, the desire for culture was so strong that, that it was unbelievable what they would go through in order to, to bring it in. The other thing that was counterintuitive uh, in your in your story was that, as you just said, the travel in Siberia was easier in the winter when everything was frozen, uh, even though it's 50 below, uh, it, it's still easier than the summer when things are a bog. And you also mentioned how terrible the mosquitoes are so uh, in the summer. Yeah, they so. say the Siberian legend is that the mosquito is born from the ashes of a cannibal in Siberia. And actually, I ended up traveling um, much more frequently with Michael in 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 the winter because I, I had a really dangerous allergic reaction to the mosquitoes um, mm -hmm. when I was in Kolyma. And it's, yeah, it's brutal. But what you really want to avoid, I believe, is the spring, which I did, which is when mm -hmm. everything turns to mud and slush. Um, in winter, it's, it, there's a, you know, it, it blankets in white. You don't see the desecration of a landscape. You don't see the ecological catastrophe of, 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 of abandoned metal. Of, uh, you see something, it kind of covers everything with a kind of poetic, white, sparkly, uh, floating rather than falling, snowy mist um and i was i i was self-aware about that but i preferred it in winter i could feel the romance and i found it more comfortable so long as you're dressed right i met this wonderful woman at the beginning and i said how do you manage in this place um mm -hmm. it's so you know how do you cope with this climate you know and she goes oh she rolled her eyes and she said oh it's um, too too cold in winter. It's too hot in summer. And then she looked at me. She was one of these old believers um, who are, are, are a very interesting uh -huh. uh, um, religious group. And she goes, um, just dress properly. I felt so patronized. <laughs> she was absolutely <laughs> right. But just and, her, and then her final closing phrase was Siberia is a wardrobe problem. I thought that was great. That's all she it was, is. It's a wardrobe. Yeah, it's just a wardrobe problem. <laughs> well, uh, before we, we leave this, uh, George Kennan, uh, this journalist is, is the father of George Kennan, the, the uh, political strategist uh, that wrote so many uh, in, uh, interesting ideas about the Soviet Union in the 1940s and 50s for, for the United States. And he's beautifully he's depicted in Ian Fraser's book, Siberia, which I yeah. uh, which I've always loved. Um, he tells that story wonderfully. But what you know, so I, I, I was I, wondering how your how I mean, this is cool. your, you made this uh, trick. What will your uh, children and grandchildren do? That's probably also connected to Russia, because this this interesting <laughs> journalist did one thing, and then the the uh, grandson or or son, I'm not sure, uh, 
you know, had a, had a major impact on trying to understand the two cultures. I don't know. And, and I, my, my, my little boy was very funny when we were in Lake Baikal one summer yeah. and I was working and we were staying in a really modest homestay. And uh, he, it, it was, we heard this screeching kind of car outside having heard mm-hmm. nothing for days. And he took his thumb out of his mouth and he goes, that'll be my taxi. I said, He's like eight years old. I said, taxi to where? And he said, Mallorca, mum. I want to go to Mallorca. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they won't want anything to do with it. I think they've had enough. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. We'll or find we won't out. find out, but somebody else will. <laughs> <laughs> but if we move to the next slide, I think this is a story that, that really kind of was a very important moment for both the, the music in Siberia and also a moment of, of real dignity. And it's it depicts Maria Volkonsky. And Maria was the a princess. She was the wife of a, of a really brave liberal um, Russian revolutionary. And there was a group of them, about 100 of them, that tried to change things. And um, a, a, very, um, um, a, a, a very ferocious Tsar um, was having nothing of it. He executed a, a large number and then he sent 100 off to Siberia. And Maria followed, Maria followed her husband, who was sent into the salt mines, and she followed with a piano, which she dragged behind on the back of her sledge. And she became an enormously important influence um, in Siberia. They ended up settling in the city of Akut. This is her and mm-hmm. her husband's um, painted by a contemporary by another of these revolutionaries, the Decembrists, as they were called, um, painting it, uh, playing the piano in um, her husband's cell. Um, uh, Christine Sutherland's written her biography. Again, it's one of the books that I I, I, I relied on heavily for its wonderful bio- biography of, of this princess. But she is an absolute lodestar in the in the in the power of 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 because she had money so she built concert halls as they started to sort of settle there after the prison sentence was up um and you start to you start to find more stories like hers um um in in other parts who are related to you know others among this group um the decembrists and i found that really interesting because they're lesser told stories and they you know there was one place called kiatka for instance where i've i i was I was totally fascinated by the fact that I found records of piano tuners traveling all the way from Kiev, Kiev, to mm. this town called Kiatka on the border with Mongolia, south of Lake Baikal in deep Siberia, to tune pianos belonging to tea merchants, Siberian tea merchants, as well yeah, I, as some of these exiles. Yeah, when, when I read that, I thought, I wonder if their travel expenses were covered because, <laughs> you know, tuning, tuning, <laughs> my brother is a piano tuner. Yeah, so uh, in, in Ventura, California, and I, I don't think he would travel four thousand miles to tune someone's piano unless unless uh, they covered the cost. Anyway, <laughs> well, I, I, the piano tuners, as you know, are the heroes of my book. Without yeah. them, I would have found nothing. They yeah. opened up their address books. They opened up their knowledge of provenance and history and people and pianos. They were everything to my book. And I was really grateful for that because I remember going at the beginning, I went to try and um, um, get the help of um, Dennis Matsu, the concert pianist. And I, I heard him in Carnegie Hall and I stood outside the door trying to mob him to try and get some help and failed. And I remember watching his piano tuner go on stage during the, um, during the, the interval. I was thinking, who is this guy? He has no name. I don't know who he is. And he's like... A star he's like a unspoken star because he's making that piano sing and I became I, I've always had in mind that those piano tuners were interesting folk whose stories weren't always mm-hmm. told because the glamour and the and the power belonged to the great virtuoso but it's a very sim- symbiotic relationship um, and they were great and if we go to the next slide you'll see where I, I was I uh, this is Novosibirsk um, the capital um, uh, or uh, the de facto capital of Siberia which became a real lodestar for my search because there was a great population of piano mm. tuners. Um, it was once known as the Chicago of the Soviet Union, Novosibirsk. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I think it will help to explain something of mm. its rich musical history. Um, so in the 1930s, Stalin started planning the Novosibirsk Opera House, the so-called Siberian Coliseum. Um, it's still the largest in Russia. 
uh, which is pretty astounding. The mm. dome's almost twice the size of the cupola at St. Paul's in London. Uh, you know, it could ac- it co- could accommodate tanks from the or- above the orchestra pit. Tractors could be driven on stage. You know, it was the ultimate sort of Soviet um, um, sort of flagship for how in the middle of Siberia cultured they could be. Um, but what I found astounding about this, and it became very important to my story, is during the war, during the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War to Russians, um, this building, which was still only half finished, became the repository for saving huge amounts of uh, Russian art and musical instruments and um, prima ballerinas and um, others, including the the Leningrad Philharmonic. They were all evacuated for safekeeping. And a lot of the treasures were layered up in the basements of this unfinished opera house. Um, And it- I thought that that was a very interesting part of your story was how much effort was put into both stealing and saving cultural um, treasures in Russia and in Germany. Yeah. Um, during during the war, it showed. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that that's the first thing that people would do if, if it happened here. I, I'm yeah. not sure. It was it, it was very interesting, it's, you know, because it, they didn't they didn't get a lot of people out, but they got no. a lot of their art no. out. Yeah, and and I think that's a very important point to make. The, if you go to the next slide, this is um, an image um, from the Leningrad siege. The Leningrad siege killed, what, 800,000? Um, mm-hmm. But they got out the ballerinas, they got out the art, they got out mm-hmm. Catherine the Great's some pay piano, all to that opera house. And we'll come back to the siege because I, I ended up circling back to this story um, mm-hmm. later on. But I think I would like you know, for, for listeners, viewers to, to remember that image because it is one that haunted me and indeed haunted a, a, a very important character in my book. Um, in the next image, we will see um, one of these great piano tuners. This is um, Vladimir Burikov, who's head of the Siberian Piano Tuners Association. He was very helpful to me. He is sitting with the piano he believed was brought to Siberia with the Leningrad Philharmonic. That, that's the Philharmonic that was meant to have played Shostakovich's seventh, um, the mm-hmm. great, um, you know, very famous piece that, that that showed how strong Russia was despite this tightening noose with the fascists. Um, right. And and, and um, so that piano, I couldn't quite trace clean provenance. It's really hard in a country with such disturbed history. But this gentleman was so helpful to me. And he led me um, to the next um, slide. This is room 1037 in the basement of the mm-hmm. Novosibirsk Opera House where the last Tsar's carpet was rolled out for a bed in World War II, one of the, the, the Tsarist treasures evacuated from Petersburg, Leningrad, as it was then called. And this is a wonderful family of piano tuners, um, four generations of one family. Vasily on the far right, he sold his house and spent a quarter of the money on a piano to give his um, family a better life. He'd been driving yeah. trucks on the border with Mongolia and he just thought music was a way out. A musical education mm-hmm. was the way out. And I cannot tell you how 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 brilliant this family were and they became critically important to my story and and um and also to my understanding of um what um common humanity we have um rather than our differences that sometimes perpetuated um when we only look at things politically well interestingly one of the differences is that there aren't a lot of parents that that uh encourage their children to go into the arts uh, rather than the opposite direction, you know, and here, here, as you said, they have a lot of stories of families that spent uh, an enormous portion of their money in order to have music. So as you say at the end, harmony, beauty, and continuity in their lives. You know, I, I, I think that that's, it's a very important cultural conclusion. And it's also very important, you know, for our future uh, as a civilization how much attention we pay to those other elements. This, yeah. I, I, I'm optimistic about it because I think once uh, the survival mode is, is, is taken care of, that people will put their attention and energy into that other element of life. But, uh, but it's an interesting thing to go back into much poorer times and see a much greater emphasis upon living a cultured life and the enjoyment of living a cultured life rather than mm. just collecting things. 
Mm. And also, it was the status of the piano. In you know, after the revolution, the piano was no longer an instrument of the bourgeoisie. They were smashing pianos in the streets in the revolution. You know, mm. it was no longer an instrument of concert halls and privilege, as it is still in largely in the West. It was a the, it was an instrument of the people. Um, mm. the, the Soviets made pianos really cheaply, and they made them accessible to many, many more people. And the education system encouraged it. And this is the thing: it's you still sure we're we're a long way on from perestroika and a lot of things have happened and electronic synthesizers have come in and all the rest of it like it has in our country and my country and in yours but there is this really really high level of musical education that still is there and definitely a very high level of respect for music and Denis Matsuyev the concert pianist he said to me when I did eventually get to him he said the audiences that he that he enjoyed in Russia and especially in Siberia he said they listen differently they're much mm. more suspicious. It's as if they they're list, they they have a, they have an acute understanding of every of every note. And um, I I I, I remembered those words, or, or or I paraphrased badly, but effectively that was his remark. And it stayed with me because it was what, if you like, um, kept me thinking that it wasn't entirely mad this quest to look for a sort of a, what it was what could otherwise just be seen as a piece of furniture these pianos mm. were capable of making music that mattered to people that 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 live pretty modest lives um i mean mm -hmm. if you go to the the next image is a classic this was a a tuner in the the university town of tomsk and he led me to this instrument um, that stood in the cottage. It was an 1896 Beckstein. It arrived on train on a train from Tomps during the war. It was sold mm. to a local for a bag of potatoes, then bought by the collective farm for a child of prodigious talent. That child, now a, 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 an older lady, um, the story she could tell. You know, she she looked after that piano so beautifully. And again, you know, I think it's very important to understand that this piano became like a passport for me. Um, it became a passport into what has also been called the land of endless talk. And so in that single instrument, you have stories, you have, you have love lost, you have, you have, you have people remembered, you have events recalled. It's so much more than just a, you know, a black box with white keys. Right, right. Uh, it's a, it's the cu cultural image that shows what people put their attention and how much attention they did and, and what their values were as to how much attention they put on it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 to me, it's like the secular equivalent of how much attention gets put onto like religious icons and so on and so forth that mm -hmm. people have as their part of their life and they may be very poor, but you know, one third of their wealth gets expended upon their religious beliefs. In this case, it's upon music. And I, I thought it was a very nice contrast um, and, and interesting to see how it spread. So, Let's let's uh, you know. I, I want to make sure we get to the priest. So <laughs> we get to the priest. Well, we'll move quickly through the next slide. Um, often I went um, into the wilds on on wild goose chases, but I had to make that attempt, um, and I saw no failure in the trying um, because mm -hmm. I mean, look how beautiful the place is. This is in the Altai Mountains down in the south, um, on the border with Mongolia. Um, I was I spent some time because I'm passionate about wildlife and and with the tiger at the beginning. I thought, well, I might as mm -hmm. well see if I can find a snow leopard. We move on to the next image. And that's me trying to find a snow leopard um, in these uh -huh. beautiful, beautiful mountains. But uh, if nothing else, they give you a sense of how remote I am by this point. And um, in this area, I was being led towards um, a gentleman I'd heard about. If we go to the next side, his name is Leonard, Leonid Koloshin. Uh, Leonid was a former Aeroflot navigator. Um, he had in his time just um, a sort of ran perestroika. He'd encountered, he'd been down in the Alta. I think he'd, he'd flown down there or something. And he encountered a young boy playing on a keyboard that was painted onto a desk. And he mm -hmm. thought, well, that's rotten. He needs a piano. Since right. then, he moved. Since then, he's distributed at his own expense 41 pianos into these mountain villages. When I said to him, I said, Leonid, I'm looking for one for this Mongolian friend of mine. I need, you know, I explained my 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 quest. And he said to me, um, well, if can you do me a favor? If you find one, I'm building a concert hall behind my behind where I live. He was building a concert hall. Yeah. This is a man who didn't have enough money to pay for firewood, but he was building building a concert hall behind. And I said to him, I looked at him, I said, but Leonid, this is so, this is the middle of nowhere. And yeah. he looked at me and it, this was a really important moment. He said, ah, this, the world is very remote. He said, 
we are at the center. And that was really, really, it was a total, my whole ethnocentricity was shifted. And I was like, yeah. I have got to stop calling Siberia the back of the beyond. It's the center of another universe for other people. Um, so I was very grateful to Leonid. Yeah, he, he looks like a really great character. And you, you told great stories about him. I will we'll, uh, let the people read the book and see. But this, this guy, you know, as you said, he was an Aerofloat navigator, uh, Aerofloat being the big Russian airline. Um, for many years, and as you said, it was amazing that he spent so much money and uh, of his efforts and everything buying small and I mean and 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 uh, inexpensive pianos, but distributing them to children to get them interested in music. Just mm. fantastic. Mm. Mm. No, they're they're good. These guys. You, you have so many interesting characters in this book. Uh, they're, <laughs> yeah, there's a few of them. There's yeah. one. There's one that I would. If you go to the next image, this is um, a lady called Nastya in the science city of Akadem Gorodok, which was, mm. um, and she led me to a really, really interesting story. Um, she was a violinist and a scientist herself, and um, it was a woman called Vera Lota Shevchenko who had. Um, she was French. Le Figaro at one point in the 1920s had called her. Um, a, you know, they described her piano playing as rare brilliance. I mean, she was a really serious player and pianist, and she ended up marrying a Russian. Um, she ended up going into a gulag. He ended up going into a gulag. He never came out. She did eight years later. Um, and during her period in, 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 in the labor camp, she um, practiced her music on a wooden keyboard carved into the side of her bunk. The first thing she did when she walked out of prison was she knocked in her prisoner's pea, pea coat was knocked on the door of a local music school and asked if she could play the piano. She did. And the descriptions of that from various sources are this magnificent school of Chopin, Bach, Liszt. And this she played for four, six, eight hours solid with people peering through the door, just could not believe what they'd heard. One thing led to another. I found his her, her last tuner. She's part. She's passed away since. But I found the last his her her piano and the piano's last tuner. And this gentleman's called Stanislav, uh, jazz pianist, professor who's taught at the um, Novosibirsk Conservatory for forty years. Um, he was one of the most important um, friendships I made. He was the gentleman who, if you remember that image from Leningrad, mm -hmm. um, who can he was confused at the age of five during the siege of Leningrad um, by seeing people sleeping on the streets. And of course, mm -hmm. they were they were corpses swept with snow. Um, yeah. But he he had a you know he lived through that siege with his mother. His uncle once came home with a rabbit, um, uh, he, and he told him it was a rabbit. It turned out they'd eaten a cat. You know it was brutal. But Stanislav survived it with um, he says um, because his mother gave him a phonograph um, for his fifth birthday, and he had two hundred records, and he listened to music, and music became solace, and music became something powerful, and music became comfortable, and music was. Redemption. And in that story that he told, um, with no self-pity, I felt I'd found the power of this thing called a piano in Russia. Um, that, and to be clear, I'm not a pianist and I'm not a musician, and but I can listen to other people's stories. And that was one that really summed the whole thing up. Yeah, uh, it, it was yet, yet another great story. And the story about Vera, too, I, I, we were talking about that. I just thought it was amazing that the other prisoners understood her passion so much because how much time would it take to carve a pretend piano into the wooden bunk? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. depending on what you've got, what equipment you're working mm -hmm. with and so on and so forth. But they mm -hmm. did that, not, not so that she could create music, but that so she could pretend that she was playing the piano mm -hmm. and keep practicing with her fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and she, that, as you said, she came out after decades of not playing a piano and could still play the piano. And I'm, I'm sure that that mm. helped keep her sane, which mm. was a very kind thing to do. Mm. Yeah, well, people are kinder than we think. When yeah, people are very kind, yeah. Um, and this is a good example. This is in um, Tobolsk. Mm -hmm. If you go on to the next slide, this is, um, I, I was just full of dead ends in this city. Um, I, I, I was I was pulling my hair out. And, um, but at the end of the day, um, I encountered a priest and I said, I said to him how, uh, what a rotten few days I'd had and found no pianos or at least no pianos that could still play. And he rather kindly said, well, don't for a minute leave my, my, my town and think that I'm, we're not musicians. And, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. he took me to the local seminary. He made a couple of calls and he took me to the local seminary and he gathered a group of friends and we snuck into the canteen. And if we go to the next slide, you can see a moment where serendipity, generosity and music all came together um, um, for a, a very special moment. Yeah. We can play this. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, that I th- hope shows something of the kindness of strangers, because against that kindness, if we go to the next slide, I was also having to um, try and understand uh, ex- the history of extreme human cruelty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, the numbers are almost unthinkable from 1801 to 1917, and more than a million subjects were killed in the Tsarist penal exile system. Under the Soviets, the Gulag system from 29 to 1953, we're talking about 2.7 million forced laborers dying in those labor camps. Mm. All these numbers are unreliable, uh, but they are so huge, you can't almost put a face to them. And yeah. the, I struggled with this. I knew I had to deal with it, even when I was also celebrating something as beautiful as music. The people you see here are the wheelbarrow men. They were in Chekhov's time. Um, these gentlemen were, were recidivist killers, and they were they were chained to their wheelbarrows night and day. Um, mm. it, the stories of cruelty are, are quite, are quite are, are, I found it hard reading. And yeah. I spent time in Sakhalin. I also, if we go on to the next slide, um, spent time up in Kolyma, which was where um, Solzhenitsyn called it the worst of the worst in the Gulag Archipelago. Um, it's right up in that far north east part of Russia. Um, the poet Shalomov said it's a good thing you can, there's no smell to a convict's tears. He was based up in this particular town. You can see me there walking across a broken bridge. Um, in 1986, however, there were about 10,000 people living in that town. And then in the 90s, the coal mine closed and it completely broke down. But this was mm. the, this grew out of a gulag. Um, it was, did I find pianos there? No piano whose history mm. I would care to, care to, to remember. Mm. Um, for the sake of my Mongolian friend, but a, a, a history that I would care to remember for a, uh, for a witness of what had occurred. Um, this piano is a modern one, but it's in the Magadan Theatre in Kolyma, a, a theatre that was built by prisoners in the 1930s. Um, four prisoners who were who, who 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 they were forced to perform. You know, that's a one one Kolyma survivor called it. You know, a travesty of freedom performed by people half mm. alive. Yet, yet in those horrible Horrors in those horrors. You had stories. Another another story I found up there was a guy called Zadaratsky, who was the last Tsarevich's piano teacher. He composed a cycle of 24 preludes for the piano on telegraph forms, tiny little scraps of paper at a time when if you were caught with a pencil and paper, you would be killed. So the bravery of these people in the context of, of such horror I, I, I wanted to, in some way, try and articulate it to at least give in some way some, some story to those numbers that I just otherwise found impenetrable. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's a tough um, thing to read about because of, of all the terror and all the death and all the cruelty and everything like that. But we, I, I think it's crucial to talk about it because... Uh, first, we don't want to repeat it, but second, we ought to apply it to what's going on now. I mean, we have in the United States uh, this mass incarceration problem where we've got 4 million people behind bars um, and we're, they're not being killed. Um, but but it, it's incredible that we do this to each other um, uh, unless, unless you have an extremely important reason for it. I know the wheelbarrow men were supposed to be the worst of the criminals, uh, mass murderers, people who just couldn't couldn't change or whatever, um, and society just can't let them uh, go free. I understand that, but it, it seems ridiculous that we use these huge numbers. And as you told in the stories about Siberia, 
people were sent off for very minor crimes. It really was a, a, a recruitment. And it's interesting how we, we use these different colonies and, and so on over time. But, but let's, let's, you know, it, it was a great part of the story. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, first of all, from a, just from a writing point of view, that you, you balanced it extremely well with the pursuit of beauty um, in, in your story. So thank you. Cause it was the hardest part. The yeah. part I absolutely most struggled with. Very um, hard. Yeah. the, the, uh, we'll finish on a slightly, uh, a, a, a more, more joyful note. I think if we go on to the next slide, um, one of, one of the things people ask is how did I find pianos and the Russian media were really, really helpful to me. Um, I found this very old piano, um, right at the beginning and I just couldn't get clean provenance. I couldn't get its story. It was in Kabarovsk and, um, uh, through, through friends of friends, um, a, a local Russian media a television station, we put a piece out and we didn't hear anything. And then, uh, about three days later, I think it was, a telephone call came in. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman said, I recognize that piano. My mm -hmm. ex-wife sold it during Perestroika. You know, <laughs> times, were, times were tough. Um, I, really? Yes, I know exactly where she is. Give me a minute. He called back um, shortly afterwards with a telephone number. That telephone number led to this apartment. If you move to the next slide. I loved it that, that she didn't even know he was still alive. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and, 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 and that that was like three floors up one of these old Christian apartment blocks. And then if you go to the next slide, it led to this woman called Nina, who played on that piano when she was a tiny child in Tobolsk, which is the uh -huh. city where I heard those priests that piano she described as the story of her childhood. And as she related the tale, she was an incredibly articulate woman, uh, a poet, um, lost her eyesight. She told the story of Russia from 1930. It was just incredible. And then if you go down to the next slide, she pulled out of a drawer. The mm -hmm. woman on the left, the young woman there, that it was her piano. It was her aunt. And this young woman had bought the piano to Tobolsk, on the back of a sledge, which I thought was mm. rather wonderful. So finally, I'd found some really clean provenance on a, on a piano that really meant something to the lady that I was just talking about. A piano where um, the, the family that own it now have made a recording and she listens to the recording because she's too fragile to move to go to the piano itself. And she listens mm. to that recording. So she's hearing her childhood in her in her last days. It's a it's pretty special. And so when we found moments like that, it was all it all kind of came good in a way. Yeah. But, um, whether or not and, and it, very very touching very touching moments and and, and uh, as again well written uh, because you can touch the reader with the same story yeah, um, well, you, you. you carry it you carry it very nicely uh, mm -hmm. right to the reader and um, yeah it's, it's amazing amazing that uh, these family treasures uh, that, that sometimes go down in this case a uh, hundred and some years right yeah 100 yeah. 110 years just yeah. I mean did it matter that it didn't play very well no it didn't. What it mattered matter. is this, 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 this woman was just full of memory and happiness. And, you know, she'd lived mm. up in Kolyma. She'd lived all over Russia. She'd seen mm. it all. Um, her grandfather was murdered in the revolution. Um, or was it her father? And it's, it's kind of, it, you know, through a single instrument, you can have that tale told to a Western writer was a, was a real privilege. And, you know, whether or not I'm successful in this quest that I started at the beginning, if we go to the next slide, you know, did I get a piano back into Mongolia um, for my friend? Um, I'm going to leave it open, I think, if I can, George, in the hope that somebody will will maybe read the book, um, because <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's an odd it's, book. It's a fantastic <laughs> ending, and I was, I was uh, uh, momentarily uh, distracted because I have a question here from our audience. Um, so let's let's throw that in, and then we'll go back to the, this uh, slide because it's a great way to end. Um, this is what it is. Um, I'm curious to know if there were any lost pianos in Kazakhstan. Sophia Kozma, the pianist featured in the documentary A Suitcase Full of Chocolate, was occasionally able to play on a piano in Karaganda during her years imprisoned in the Soviet internment camp throughout World War II. 
She otherwise practiced silently on a tabletop in the camp. So another story like that. Have you heard that story? I've never heard that one, but I, I'm going to make sure I listen to the recording so I get a name so I have a look. I did I did find one in, I was working in Tajikistan. I was doing a story for the Financial Times just before COVID. And I found a piano um, down on the uh, the on the on border with Afghanistan that had come, um, come down in the 19th century, which I thought was pretty amazing. So that oh. whole, that whole stands area, um, right. I'm grateful for the for your viewer to mentioning that because i do think it's really super interesting i did come across stories in, in kazakhstan of them being smashed to pieces during during the revolution i also encountered this you know there's a chapter in the book about harbin which was um in now in modern day china but then was kind right. of manchuria and it was effectively russian and uh, some pretty interesting piano history there but yeah i will look that up thank you very much um, for that information yeah, thanks to the audience, uh, and uh, we we have there's so many things we could cover, but we've we've run out of time. Um, the the story about Harbin also very interesting, and the research that was done there. I mean, there's just so many different cross currents. But I think the basic uh, idea uh, of your book, which is done so well uh, using the images of the pianos, is that culture uh, survives in the, in the most unusual places. Um, that 500 years from now, someone will find a lost piano on the moon and, 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 and will not know how they got it there uh, or, or how someone snuck it onto a, a ship at that cost in order to bring music to the outer space. Something like that, because uh, I think it just says what's going on with humanity, what's crucial to our lives. And the more we learn that and the more we really go with that uh, element of our lives, uh, the easier it will be to take the other parts. Uh, so. Sophie, thank you very, very much for sharing your book and, and, and all that research and all the time that you spent on it. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, George. And thank you, everyone. My pleasure. It was great. <laughs>